Hello guys, welcome to Hankins Custom Rifles, another episode of Hanks TV. Today is July the 19th, uh, Thursday morning. I've got Denise, my helper, with me again today. And we're going to show you how we make recoil lugs here in the shop. Now this is how I make them. I'm sure other people out there make them a little bit different, but we're going to go over the, uh, the process and how I make my recoil lugs here at the shop. Now these are made out of 416 stainless steel, the same type of steel that your barrels are made out of. So when you bead blast them or polish them or whatever, it'll have the same look to the material. If you make it out of other stainless steels, sometimes they're a little bit yellowish or reddish. And you think, how can stainless steel be red? Well, when you compare it to another stainless steel that isn't red, you can actually see there's a little tint to it. So I try to make them out of 416 stainless and we're gonna bring you in, show you how we do that. Uh, Denise is gonna do all of this today and I'm gonna go in and work on a Ruger number one that I'm converting over into a muzzle loader. So I'm gonna let her show you what we do here on this to make this recoil lug. And then we'll talk about it a little bit. Okay guys, so we're here at the bandsaw. This is a closing bandsaw, it's 10 to 16, which means that it's, that's its cutting capacity. It's got cooling on it, it's a pretty nice saw. Just got this a month or two ago and it's been a, a great addition to the shop. It sure beats the one I used to have. And I've got the knees trained on this saw pretty good already. She knows how to operate it, it's pretty simple. So she's just gonna go ahead and start um, setting the parts and I'll go along and tell you what she's doing as she's doing it. So she's got to raise up the saw. It is manually operated. We're going to release the handle. We're going to slide the bar in until it just touches that stop right there. She'll tighten the handle back up. Come around to the front, turn the saw on. Okay, you can see this little block of aluminum I made right here. I made that and cut that to that shape so that when that part falls off, it doesn't fall down into the chips or get caught up underneath the saw table itself and cause us any problem. So now that that's cut off, she can come in there and just roll it out. We'll dip it in this bucket of water here to rinse off all the chips and the shavings that's on it. She's going to measure it to make sure it falls within specs. And we want between 375 and 400, and that one measures 390, or roughly. So that's plenty good enough. Now you guys might add wonder why I make these out of round shot. I can buy this round stock bar much cheaper then I can buy the same bar in a flat stock. And we're going to machine a lot of it away. I know there's not a whole lot left once we get this recoil bar done. But economical for me, this is the best way to do it. that she cut yesterday we've got about a hundred and about 200 of them there I would guess and when it's all said and done with we're going to be like this right here so this round piece right here is going to go in the machine 
it's going to be clamped up into a set of jaws and we're going to machine that recoil lug out of this round disc and when we do that here in the next week or two i'll try to bring you guys in on the video and show you how that's done Hello guys, welcome to Hankins Custom Rifles and another episode of Hanks TV. Today's August 15th, 2018, and we are at the CNC milling machine making some recoil lugs today. Now in the earlier part of this video, you saw Denise cutting all these parts on the bandsaw and turning them into blanks that we are now putting into the CNC machine. So what we've done is we took that bar of steel that you guys saw in, in the saw and we have cut them up into little pieces just like this. I have deburred one side, knocked the burr off of it, and that's the side that we're gonna set flat in the vise of the CNC machine. Now I've just finished making one. The machine just shut down. We're almost done with this job and I wanted to finish the video before we completely finished them. So what we've only got, we've got eight parts left and this job will be done in the CNC milling machine. It'll be ready to go over to the grinder. I'll take you over there in just a second and show you some of these being precision ground on the surface grinder. And then we'll take you over and show you what we do when they're completely finished. But for now, let's come on into the machine here and I'll show you what we've got on the inside. Okay guys, so we're gonna open up the doors on the machine. I'll bring the guys on in here and I'll show you what we've got. And I'll try not to step in front of the camera too much, but that's going to be completely inevitable to get everything without getting in the camera. I'm going to reach over here in front of the camera, and we've got a little air nozzle here, and I'm going to blow off these two vices. I'm going to explain to you what we're doing here, and I'm taking the vice handle and I'm going to put it on this vise and loosen that so I can get my part out. And I'm going to do that on both sides. Okay. So now here is a finished part ready to go to the precision grinder. That's been faced off with a face mill. It's been chamfered. I got a little chamfer around this side, which is what's going to be on your barrel side. This will be on your action side. So this corner here is left nice and square. We've got a small chamfer in here, and I drill three pinholes. If you decide you want to pin this to your action for a switch barrel, I recommend you using the out, the, at least the two outside holes. Some guys will use all three of them. If you're not going to make a switch barrel gun, you do not need to pin the recoil lug to your action. So I'm going to set this one down on the table and show you what else is next to come out of here. So now you can see this recoil lug that was made from this round piece of 416 stainless steel. That is made on here, and what we're going to do now is put it in this vise, and I need to blow out that pocket again. I'm going to blow off this surface of the recoil lug. We don't want any dirt or contaminants between the two surfaces. That's going to set down in this pocket that has been machined into these steel vice jaws. So that's going to sit right down in there like a piece in the puzzle. And we're ready now, we can tighten this vise. So that one's tight, that's as tight as you want to go with it. You can actually crush that part in these Kirk vices. They can put like 10,000 pounds of pressure on your part. I'm going to blow out that pocket real good and if you can see it good in the video camera, it is a circle that has been machined into these steel vice jaws. And I'll take one of my parts that was cut on the bandsaw. We've cut these at 375 thick, 3 eighths of an inch. And we're going to set that right down into this pocket. See how that goes in there? Then we're going to tighten this vise. I'll hang my vice handle back over there where it goes and we're ready to close the doors now and start the cycle. We're going to take a minute, set the camera back on the tripod and as soon as we get that done guys we'll push the cycle start button and you can watch this run. 
Okay guys, we, we are ready to push the cycle start button. You guys have seen me do that before in the video, so I'm not gonna bring you over to the button. I just wanted to get the window clean for start and it's probably gonna get coolant splashed on it and we'll do the best we can to keep it cleaned off for you. So here we go, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna start the machine up and it's gonna change tools. That's a 45 degree face mill. It's gonna come in and face off the top of the first part. Then it's gonna jump over and face off our chucking stock on the second operation. Once that is finished on that part right there, that part is completely finished. There's no more operations to do to that other than deburr the hole in the center. This is the center drill that's coming in and putting in the, t the three holes that we're gonna put the pins in. That's just doing the center drill so that everything starts out where we want it to. We're running a high pressure flood cooling on there, washing the chips away, keeping the drill bits cool. This is a 916 drill. Cool it through and it can really drill some material quick. This is our profile tool. It's coming in doing the 1.062 hole in the center. It hogs out the material pretty quick. Now the profile tool is going to go around and cut the shape of the recoil lug into that slug of metal we've got in there. This takes a little while. We cut the entire profile with one pass. Okay, once we cut the profile, we rough it in. We're gonna change tools and come in with a finisher and it's gonna go around the inside hole and open that up to 1.065. We make two passes in there. One's a spring pass just to take anything out if there's any flex or de deflection in the tools. Now when it gets done with that, it's going to jump out and go around the outside surface again. I'm going to go ahead and turn that cooling off and show you what it's doing. It's going around the surface, the outside edge of the recoil lug. And now that's just taking off about two thousandths of an inch. You can see it's not throwing out hardly any chips. What little bit it's throwing out is just little fine slippers. There's enough cooling there to keep that end mill cool for this job so I can actually show it to you run without the cooling on. When that's done, it's going to jump up and change tools and I will leave it, I'll leave the door open because it's cool. Chamfered the inside, this is chamfered the outside. Go 
We're running 3,500 RPMs and 35 inches a minute. So now it's going to just touch that and knock off that sharp edge. The next tool has a tool in it, so I'm going to close the doors. That is our drill bit that we're using to drill the holes for the pins. I can't remember what the number of that drill bit was, but it's just a few thousand smaller than what we need. We're going to come in here in just a second with a carbide reamer and precision ream those three holes. It is a small drill, so I got it set up to do a peck cycle. It drills down about 30 or 40 thousandths and then retracts. Pulls the drill bit, drills down 30 or 40 more, and it just keeps working that way until it gets completely through the part. I wish you guys could see this better. Um, I may run another one completely through with no cooling on it so you guys can actually see what we're doing here. I know this is probably boring looking at all that coolant running down the glass. Now this is the precision reamer coming through for the last operation. It's going to ream those three holes. Then this job is done. The table moves back towards us. And we're ready to reach in there now and blow off those parts like we did earlier. And change them out. But what I'm going to do, guys, I'm going to run these parts again. I'm going to leave those parts in there so that you can see the tool path and understand more of what's going on with the machine. You won't have all that coolant coming up on this window. So let's do that. And let me go ahead and get this started. Make sure I get the coolant off in time. We don't want to take a bath. Okay, so there is the facing cycle. And I'm also going to run this at 200%. So it could run a little faster. It won't take eight minutes to run this part. We can probably do it in four minutes. I'll just turn the machine up to run it at 200%. the uh, center drill coming in and drilling.
radius across the bottom. Another nice little radius. All the way back up and around the other side. both the vices up. Doesn't matter which one you open first as long as you remember to close both of them. Now this part right here is the finished part ready to go to the surface grinder. This is a precision recoil lug and I have made up a bunch of these. So let's go ahead and switch it over. We're going to take this one out. It usually leaves this little piece right here in the bottom of that pocket. <clears throat> that's just a, um, that's the piece off the bottom of that drill. As it's drilling through that part, it punches that little circle. It just punches it out. That partly could be because the drill's getting a little dull, but it's still drilling good, so I'm not changing it. Blow out both pockets. We're going to take the one that we took out of here and put it over here. Put it right down in this pocket. We're going to put the new piece in the vice jaws here where we have made our little pocket to hold that round stock. We're going to tighten that vice jaw up. We're now ready to start the cycle all over again. So we're going to go ahead and run some more. And I'm gonna, while this is running, I'll take you over and show you the precision surface grinder, us grinding the parts and getting them ready to be completely finished. Okay guys, I'm gonna talk loud because there's a lot going on and I know this machine's drowned out my voice, so I hope you all can hear me. We're over here at the precision surface grinder. This is an old Jacobson grinder, probably built back in the 70s or maybe even goes all the way back to the 1960s. It's a hydraulic grinder, but it, and it works fine. It's old, but it's really in good shape. It hasn't been used much for the life that it's had. It's really old machine, but it's not even nowhere near wore out. So I'm going to bring you in here and show you what we've got on the grinder. And I can set these recoil lugs up on this grinder, and we can grind 28 recoil lugs at one time. These are finished on one side. They're ready to be cleaned up and turned over. And I'll grind about two thousandths of an inch off the other side, take a measurement on them, and then finish them up, bring them down to 250 or 249 and a half, whatever it may come out at. So I've got these little guards on here. I'll take these guards. I'll take them off for now. That just keeps some of the splash off of my floor. So it's left I have to clean up. But there's an example of what a precision surface grinder looks like and what it's doing. We've got a 46 grit wheel right here that's been dressed and it runs over the top of these parts. These parts are stuck to 
this magnetic table top right here. And I'm going to turn the magnet on or off in order to release the parts and hold it down while you're driving. One thing you want to always make sure that you do is you try to turn the tractor long enough to the lady you're not going to do it. And that's make sure you always turn the magnet on. If you don't, you're going to throw them parts off and they're going to just go scattering all over the place. You can also see this other makeshift guard that I put on my machine. That is to keep a lot of the overspray from missing the guarding that was originally on here. I do believe they had more stuff on this machine, but when I bought it, it was missing. So I just made this up out of some plastic that keeps it from blowing the stuff over onto my wall. And I also covered my wall up in my furnace with newspaper in the cardboard box to keep it off of my furnaces. So now these are done and it is completely at the end of the other side. So this is a good time to stop the machine. And I'll finish it and stop it at this stroke right here. I can turn it off. Now I don't have to talk quite so loud. This is what they look like when they're finished on the surface driver. I run cooling on them so that they don't get hot. And if you get them hot, they'll just turn them around a little bit like you just grind it. So you all know what it looks like when you grind it. It gets hot and cool. It keeps it from getting hot and it also keeps your wheel in here from loading up um, with grinding dust and starts to make a nasty looking grind. So now that I've showed you how the surface grinder works, I'm going to go over here and show you a part that's completely finished and ready to be bead blasted. Then I'll show you a bead blasted part and one that's finished and in a bag and ready for delivery. Okay guys, we've got every step of the process right here in front of me and I'm going to go over each one of these steps with you as a recap and then you'll understand 100% how recoil lug is made or at least how I make them. There's other ways they could be made. They could have been made from square stock. They could have been made from flat stock. They could have been laser burnt out of a big sheet, which a lot of people are burning them out now with a laser. Um, I don't think that's the most accurate way to do it. I would much rather machine mine from solid bar stock. But they are doing laser cut parts now or wire EDM. That would be pretty accurate but you still have two surfaces that you have to clean up. So I would machine mine, I would rather machine mine, and this is what we've got. So if you look down here now at this table, we started out with a bar of this material right here. This is a bar of stainless steel. It came to me, it was 12 feet long and weighed 245 pounds. I cut that bar up into slices this big. They all come off of this bar right here. So you can just keep stacking these back up and they all come off of this bar. So once we sliced it into this, off of the bar, you saw me put that in the machine and we make this piece out of it. This piece down here that's still left on here, this is called your chucking stock. We left a hundred thousands to hold on to. So the vise in the machine can hold this part while it's being cut and it's not distorted any at all. You could have made it other ways, but if you hold on to your part, it could distort the part. So we held on to what we're going to throw away anyhow. So your part is machined perfectly to the dimensions that you want it to be machined at. Then we took this piece, put it in the other vise upside down, and it come in and machined off the chucking stock, threw all that away goes out in the chip conveyor and we wound up with this piece that's that's machined finished it's ready to go over to the surface grinder I left these finished at 256 thousandths so if you can look right here at my Michitorio thickness gauge you can see we've got 256 thousandths thick and I'm going to grind those down the, the, the perfect number is 250 that's a quarter inch. You don't usually get them at perfect 250. I get them 250 and a half or 249 and a half. That's close enough for what we're dealing with because you're building a brand new gun. You're going to set your head space to whatever thickness this measures. It don't matter if it's 255 or 245 or 187 or 312 or whatever size recoil lug you want to use for your gun. 
you as the gunsmith take into consideration how thick the repo lug is and a half a thousandth is not going to make a difference either way plus or minus won't make a difference so then i took you over to the surface grinder and i showed you grinding some of these parts this is one straight off the surface grinder it's got a nice pretty shiny finish on it and it looks nice but i still prefer to bead blast it so I'm gonna put each one of these in my glass bead blaster. And I'm gonna bead blast it to a nice satin finish around the outside, because a lot of guys don't have a bead blaster and they want a bead blasted finish on the repo wood. They don't want a shiny finish like this on their hunting rifle. So I bead blast all of them. It just makes it look as a more finished part. Okay, so they're all gonna to come to you bead blasted. Now, I've been machining my lugs a little different than most other recoil lugs that I've bought in the past. And I've been building rifles for well over 20 years and I've used just about every recoil lug that people make. I've bought them just about everywhere. And there's always been something that I can change to improve on them and I think I've done that with my recoil lugs here. And I'm going to go over a few of those changes with you. The side that goes next to your barrel has a nice chamfer right here. And the reason I put that chamfer into this recoil lug was when you're cutting your tenon on the barrel, a lot of people will come over and they'll do a big plunge cut right there at the end of the shoulder where the recoil lug mates up to the shoulder. If at all possible, you want to try to not do that because that creates a weak, a weak spot in your barrel wherever you do a plunge cut it makes for a weak spot or wherever you have a perfectly square corner it's a weak spot you want to come in there with your tool with a nose radius of eight to about sixteen thousandths and you want to just come in there and come straight out so it leaves a nice radius corner in your barrel shoulder to your tenon and then that will allow you to leave yourself a sixteen thousandths radius on your barrel shoulder you don't have to go in do any undercutting I also come around this edge right here that's going to be facing out away from the action and we put on like a five thousandths chamfer all the way around so it's not sharp, it's not going to cut you. I know you guys have built a lot of guns and worked with these recoil lugs and if you're not careful, you drag your knuckle across it or something, it'll actually roll your skin up. They're razor blade sharp. I eliminated that by putting that chamfer on. The opposite side of the recoil lug has a smaller chamfer right here, so it's easy for you guys to see which side goes towards the barrel and which side goes towards the action. We've also put in three pinholes. If you want to use them, you can. If you don't want to use them, you don't have to. If you're going to make a switch barrel gun, I recommend that you use the two outside pinholes. That way you can take the barrel off and put it back on your recoil lug will be in the exact same place every time. If you only use the center pinhole, the recoil lug can pivot on you. So now I want to show you this action that I've got laying on the table. This is just a standard Remington 700 action. It's got a recoil lug locating fixture attached to the action. And I'm going to show you another thing that I've done a little different than all the rest of these recoil lugs that I have used in the past. Now, this right here is a factory Holland recoil lug. And this fixture is made to fit Holland recoil lugs. You can tell that this lug right here was burned out on wire EDM because the inside is kind of gold looking. That's where they burned it with an EDM. They blasted the outside edges to knock off that burn. You don't want that brown, you can see it in there. That's from an EDM, most likely. Then they did bead blast the outside. The two surfaces are left as produced off of a Blanchard grinder. This does not look to me like it was done on a surface grinder. It looks like it was done on a Blanchard grinder. But if you drop this into this locating fixture, you can see that it drops well below the center line of this action. So when you bring it back up to the center line and you try to get it to locate, 
it wants to pivot back and forth. So it's very hard to locate it in the same place twice. Not a big deal if you're going to build a gun and never take the recoil lug off and you're going to bed it after it's all put together and you don't break it back apart. If you do break it back apart, you don't know for sure if your recoil lug was over here or was it on this side or did you have it centered or what. Okay, so that could be a problem for some guys. If you look at this recoil lug here, which is made by another major manufacturer that sells and makes a lot of recoil lugs, look at how far past the center line it goes. So if you're using a Holland recoil lug, and this is supposed to be a copy of a Holland recoil lug, it's going to be way up here when you screw your barrel on. So now you've got this much play in it. You can see this wobbling around. And if you was to pin with just this one center pinhole that is drilled in here for you to use as a locating pin, it's still going to wobble back and forth on that pin. It's going to pivot because it's just got one place that you pinned it. If you're building a switch barrel gun, this will not work very well for you at all. You're going to put your recoil lug back on. You're going to drop your barrel to action back down in your stock that's been bedded and you're going to notice that your scope is sitting crooked or your action is sitting crooked you just can't get your gun leveled back up the way you want it that's because your recoil lug is not back in the same place if you look at one of my recoil lugs and you drop it down in there it stops almost perfect on the center line you have very very little wiggle room it won't wiggle hardly at all that's because I've changed the dimensions on the outside edges of this recoil lug. <clears throat> Will it make a big difference to most of you guys? No, it won't make a big difference. Hardly at all. But to me, when I build these guns, I might put it together, embed it, and then take it back apart. I might build a switch barrel gun for a guy. You know, you just never know when you're going to run into this problem. If you've got one of these lugs, you're not going to run into the problem. And then I give you three pinholes to use if you want to pin it. I've said it a couple times in this video already. If you're going to make a switch barrel gun, pin the two outside pinholes. That's about all I can tell you on why I think my lug is a little better than the competition's lug. And they're cheaper. I can manufacture them right here in my own shop. I don't have a bunch of overhead. So I can sell these things to you guys a little bit cheaper than all the rest of the people do out there. So once it's completely done and bead blasted, I'm going to use my little Michitoyo thickness gauge again and I'm going to check the thickness on this lug. And this one right here is coming in right at 250 and about 7 tenths if you guys can see that. To me that's close enough to put it in the bag. Okay. Now, when I grind these, I'm going to grind 28 of them at a time. So all 28 that come off the surface grinder will measure the same. The next 28 may be a little bit different. I can hold them within thousands of either side, and that's close enough for me. I measured this one, and it measured 249 and a half. So what I do is this goes in the bag. I write on here, recoil of part number 2. Our part number is RL2495. And that's going to be inventory put on the shelf and ready for sale. This one right here is so close to 251, I'm probably just going to call it Repo Lug 251 and put it on the shelf. Pretty easy. Um, these are available or will be available on my website soon. If you need one before you can find them on the website, go ahead and give me a call here at Hankins Custom Rifles. You can look me up on the internet, HankinsCustomRifles.com, get my phone number off the website. So I just wanted to bring you guys through. A lot of you like to see and see videos. I wanted to show you a good video step by step of how we make some parts here at Hankins Custom Rifles. And the biggest reason I'm making these is so that I don't have to buy them. Um, but if I'm going to make them for myself, I might as well make them for you guys too. You can save a little bit of money and get a much more quality part, I think. So, till the next time, guys. This is what we've done here today at Hankins Custom Rifles. We've been making recoil lugs and getting ready to 
put some on some new rifle builds. Next time, until next time, thumbs up on the videos, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and we'll see you later.